Describe how that picture well, took place. What well, happened as that was it? When they, I was on the air broadcasting the president's death when the uh, <clears throat> White House travel office person grabbed me by the, I called my suit collar from behind and said I had to go with him. And I said, I'm on the air, I'm not leaving this. I'm not leaving, damn it, I'm on the air. He said, well, we need a pool. I said, well, get Pierpoint, it's his turn. I mean, we're arguing over the biggest story of the century and I'm not wanting to go to cover it, it's crazy. Yeah. I couldn't believe it when I looked back and thought of my fighting over it. But I did go and we picked up Merriman Smith and Chuck Roberts of Newsweek and went down through the hospital and they had an unmarked police car waiting for us and they said, we're going out to Air Force One. We took off and we were doing 60 to 70 miles an hour through Dallas over uh, uh, curbs, driveways, lawns, no matter how this police officer could get there through backyards trying to get to Air Force One before it took off back to Washington. Got to the airport and Mrs. Kennedy had just arrived with the casket and they were putting the casket onto the aircraft and they had to carry it up the incline of the rear stairs. This was a 707, big airplane, a majestic airplane because Mrs. Kennedy and Jack Kennedy had helped design the colors. The colors you see on Air Force One today and the lettering were designed by Mrs. Kennedy and Jack Kennedy. It was a brand new airplane that came into his administration. So they had a piece of it in the his history as well. They had to knock four handles off the casket because it can't, the handles were sticking out and they couldn't get it into the airplane. So the Secret Service got an ax somewhere and they knocked off the handles and were able to manage to get the thing in there. I went around the side of the airplane with uh, Merriman Smith and Chuck Roberts and climbed in from another side of the, the aircraft coming from the front end of the plane, went back to the midship, midships, and I saw Mrs. Johnson, I saw President Johnson in there with a group of people, and President Johnson was talking to Marie Famer, his secretary. I talked to Marie for a little bit, and they said they were trying to assemble and uh, get a judge from downtown to come out and do the swearing in. Mrs. Kennedy was in the rear with the casket. At, uh, Marie told me that when the president arrived on, on the aircraft, which was maybe 15 minutes, no more than that, than Mrs. Kennedy's arrival, the first thing he did was he asked for a hot cup of vegetable soup. And he said to Marie, I've lived a year since this morning. And then he told her, and I overheard him tell her that I would like you to go and ask Mrs. Kennedy if she will stand with us at the swearing in. And Marie went back and talked to Mrs. Kennedy or, or sent a message back. And the message came back, yes, I will, I'll come, but I want a few minutes to com compose myself. And so we waited. By this time, the room was uh, stifling hot, probably 120 degrees. It had been sitting in, under a hot sun and only one engine had been running to keep the uh, electronics going. And it was probably a few minutes before Mrs. Kennedy appeared in, in the doorway. And that's when the sobbing, the, the quiet sobbing by the young Kennedy staff, you have to understand these were young people in their 20s and 30s who had made the long march to the campaign and made him president and they'd gone through the Bay of Pigs and, and the Cuban Missile Crisis and he was their, their hero and now he was gone. And this, the sadness of this scene was evident on the faces of these young women with the mascaras streaking their cheeks as, as uh, they, they were waiting for Mrs. Kennedy. And once she came into the room, uh, the crying became uh, almost unbearable among everyone. The sobbing was just uh, uh, unbelievable. And Was Mrs. Kennedy crying? Mrs. No. Was Jackie Kennedy crying? No, she was not. She was standing in the doorway and we could see her. President Johnson left his place in the middle of the room, walked over to her, took her by both hands, and he walked backward sort of backward and took her and placed her to his left in the center of the room and he pulled Mrs. Johnson over to his right. And he asked for a glass of ice water and Marie brought him some ice water and then he took, looked at the judge and he said, proceed. Now as a pool reporter, it's my responsibility to write everything I saw. Uh, I'm just a rinky dink reporter who covered the police station in Ohio and now I'm covering one of the biggest stories in the world. And I have to tell you that I was worried that I wouldn't get everything I had to get. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was such an important story. But I, I examined her pretty carefully. I saw blood on her, her legs. It had congealed on both legs. I saw blood and speckles of her brain matter on her, on her skirt and on her blouse. I noticed that she 
was unblinking. Uh, she was in grief, but she had her wits about her. She knew was exactly what was going on. She understood everything was going on. I don't think she would have come forward had she not known what was going on. I think in the annals of history, this was one of the most courageous things I've ever seen between a president and a, another first lady, where she, I believe, having to, uh, suffering the, probably the worst thing that could happen to a married couple, losing your husband in a murderous situation, leaving the casket to come up front to attend the ceremony took a lot of courage. And I think Mrs. Kennedy felt it was important for her to be in that room. At the same time, I thought that gesture by President Johnson asking her to come forward if she, she he said, if she would like to stand with us mm -hmm. because he knew the circumstances. I think that uh, the, the, the opportunities for greatness were there in that, in that setting for this so brief a time. The compassion shown by President Johnson, I've never, I've never seen it since. He, he had invited all the members of the Kennedy staff on the airplane that wanted to, to come into the compartment. They jammed the compartment as close as they could. He asked people to get closer together so that more of the Kennedy people could, could attend the thing. Uh, in his behavior, I never saw anybody who was more resolved than what he had to do. He had, he had his wits totally about him. Uh, he went over as soon as the oath was finished. He kissed Mrs. Johnson. Then he kissed Mrs. Kennedy on the cheek. Then he went over to President Kennedy's secretary, Evelyn Lincoln. Mm -hmm. He shook her hand and held her tightly and said he was sorry that this had happened. And then he fended off almost any effort on the part of anyone to come up and congratulate him, which was another sign of, I think, his greatness. And he did not want this to turn into a celebration. And the, the somber mood that existed from the beginning was there at the end. My friend Chuck Roberts, one of the other poolers, who was standing near me but went over to President Johnson, and he shook his hand. He looked up at the president. He was, the president was 6'3 or 6'4. And he looked up at the president. He told me later, he said, I looked up at him, and now he's different. And he said, I didn't know what to say. So I said, Godspeed, Mr. President. And I thought, I wish I could have said something like that. It was, it was so appropriate for him to have said that. And then President Johnson's first order was, let's get airborne, that they knew they had to move that airplane out of Dallas and get back to Washington. 